Thank you for that reading. One of the things I love about uh, being here in Berkshire has been seeing all of the red kites that uh, wheel above our heads from time to time. Um, they even land in the tree back there. And uh, I just love seeing them. They're so majestic and so wonderful. And today we're starting a sermon series on the Gospel of John. And the red kites made me think about one of the symbols that's often used to describe John and his Gospels. And that is, classically, he's been likened to an eagle. And that idea of an eagle soaring, looking down, giving a big overview in such majesty is come to represent something of the, the riches of this gospel account of Christ's life, of who Christ is and who he was and what he came to do. And the reading for today comes from the introduction to John's gospel, and he's introducing us to the themes of his gospel. And of course, the greatest theme of all is the question, who is this Jesus? Who is he? What did he come and do? And what do we, how do we respond to him? That is the biggest question of all that we all need to come and grapple with. And what does John say? Well, he talks about Christ in the most amazing words as he outlines what he's going to talk about in the rest of his gospel. He says that Jesus is one with God, not lesser than God, but truly God, part of the Trinity, one God. God the Father, speaking by the breath of the Spirit, Jesus, who is the most important utterance of God, Father, Son and Spirit, all three persons but one God. And how John puts it like this, everything was created through him, nothing, not one thing, came into being without him. What came into existence was life and the life was light to live by. This light life blazed out of darkness and the darkness couldn't put it out. So the whole of creation, the red kites, the plants, people, the chicken, the egg, all made by him and for him. And this means that it's only in a truly harmonious relationship with him that we can have life, true life. But you know, that's not our experience, is it? You know, I've had conversation after conversation over the years, but also recently about the pain and suffering of life, the joys, but also the broken aspects of life. This whole experience of coronavirus that we're living through shows our human brokenness, that groaning of creation, used and abused and perhaps fighting back. You know, most incredibly of all, John says, God does not remain aloof from the world, not disinterested, not supreme and untouchable, but he enters in. He steps over the doorstep and into human life. And I'm reading from, uh, I'm just going to do another little reading from the uh, message version of the Bible, which I just think puts it so beautifully and so poetically. And it says, the word, that is Jesus, became flesh and blood and moved into the neighbourhood. We saw the glory with our own eyes, the one of a kind glory, like father, like son. So this is an incredible part of the Christian hope. God came as Jesus and entered into the life of humankind, living and experiencing the highs, the lows, the laughter, the, the blood, the sweat, the tears of human existence, and all to suffer and die on a cross to buy us back to himself, to that buy us back into that harmonious human living. In the words of Paul in Philippians, he says, in your relationships with one another, have that same mindset of Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped and used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing. He emptied himself, poured out, by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. So here we have Christ coming into our world. He crosses the biggest boundary of all, the boundary between God and humankind. Now there's something really interesting here, isn't there? You know, he says that in your relationships, you should have the same way of thinking that Jesus acted. He talks about in humility, emptying ourselves and becoming like servants to one another. We have to cross boundaries towards one another. 
Now, I think we're all aware that of boundaries in our lives. Some we have erected, some others have erected and erected against us. Mostly it's about difference. You know, I'm like this and you're a bit different. You know, here am I, a Doctor Who fan, but you know, well, that's weird. Uh, you know, you're different and you are another. We put people into this category of other and the fear of the other, the uncertainty of knowing how to, re to cope and to react, for some people is expressed in, in vile hatred or at least discomfort in others and a desire to separate, ignore and denigrate others. Do you know, that's the heart of racism. And there's a socially unacceptable type of racism, of course, but there's also a socially acceptable type of it as well. This denigrating and ignoring and separating, doing nothing about it. I think we're aware of the inequality and poverty that so many people from black, Asian and minority ethnic backgrounds have to overcome. Inequality that has meant that so many more from ethnic backgrounds have suffered and died from coronavirus. I mean, you can't have missed the recent demonstrations provoked by the wicked killing of George Floyd, like so many others before him who've been killed and even after him who have been killed completely unjustly. They're not easy demonstrations to watch for many reasons, but we have to hear in it this cry for hope for a better future. Now, I'd like to talk a little bit more about racism, but I feel really rather inadequate being white, but I do want to explore it deeper. So what I've got coming up is an interview with a really good friend of mine, uh, Leonard, who I was uh, really privileged to be ordained with. And um, I've been spending the last couple of years in a, um, a, a, a curate support group uh, where we spend a lot of time talking and chatting. And it's been a, wonder, a real privilege to get to know him better. And so I asked I ask Leonard, would you help me talk through this whole question and from his point and his understanding? So take it away. Hi, good morning, Leonard. Morning, Kevin. Hey, lovely to see you today. So, so yeah, thank yeah. you so much for uh, offering to uh, just have a little chat with me and ask a few, answer a few questions for me. So um, could you just tell me a little bit about yourself, you know, your family, your career, calling, etc. Yeah, well, as you said, as we already said, I'm Leonard. Uh, I was born in Nigeria. I came to the UK as a young boy. Uh, I think about 12, the first time I, I came over. Um, I'm married to Joanna, she's white. We've been married for about 20 years now. And we have three teenagers. Um, Career-wise, before theology and being ordained, I got a specialist doctorate degree in an engineering discipline. And I went to work for a pre prestigious company. And I worked in Europe and then in uh, Southeast Asia for a while, um, for about a year in the UK as well. Uh, I was in Southeast Asia when um, God finally, um, not that he caught up with me, finally <laughs> got my attention. I'd been making excuses up until that time, but um, um, I, th I think I saw, I was a blind man giving a safety talk that finally arrested me because I thought, he asked, what would you most regret if you suddenly lost your sight? And I knew it would be all those times that I passed up on the possibility of exploring ordination and yeah uh, tearfully i bid my lovely career goodbye came back to the uk to explore ordination and uh years later here i am oh fantastic well i mean our subject today we're talking about how our experience of racism and um difficult subject but is there something you can tell us about the ways you have experienced racism perhaps in bigger or smaller ways Yes, um, I, I, I am being careful. I think I, we chatted about this a bit. I'm being careful about the examples I choose because some of them are live. They're people you and I know and places we know as well. Um, but a couple of them stand out. I think the most obvious one, um, thankfully, wasn't in this country, was in the Netherlands when I arrived uh, because of my qualification to do a particular job. And my neighbour, realising that what the... Uh, realizing somehow that I was going to be paid a lot of money to do this job, 
rather than saying, oh, hello, welcome to the neighborhood, straight away look me in the eye and say, so what is it you can do that a white person can't do? Um, <laughs> uh, okay, <laughs> nice to meet you too. Um, I sort of chuckled at, at that when I went back indoors with Joanna. Um, but in this country, there's one I've sort of, I've sort of mixed who, where it was, I wouldn't talk about where it was or who he was, but our politics, I was virtually ignored for something that I was the most qualified person to do in the absence of any other person having skills near being able to do it. And, um, and this went on for quite a while, over a year. And all the people were invited to muddle along with this thing. And I was completely ignored. And there was no other explanation. It's just, yeah, you're black. And uh, let's mm. put it bluntly. Mm. Yeah, yeah, so those, those are the two big ones. Yeah. That, that and how, how, does it, how does it make you feel? Well, I have felt, um, uh, yeah, it hurt. To be ignored hurt. Because I thought the least they could do was just say hello and oh we realize you can you can actually do this or we realize this is who you are because they knew quite well and not doing that i think really hurt because they in my view they dehumanized me for that period and yeah yeah, i think now that i'll say is what hurt the most yeah and um you know being um you know quite sensitive uh, what has your experience of being uh, black in the church of england been like has that been a good experience i smile because <laughs> you would think we christians know better wouldn't you um it's been very interesting to put it that way uh, sometimes again amusing um but <laughs> one as when i first arrived at my curacy church one of the parishioners came up to me and said oh right so you'll be starting a charismatic service then and i was thinking because i am uh <laughs> from what um, obviously he saw a black person and thought oh naturally you guys do charismatic services you've got your drums with you that sort of thing <laughs> and my drums um, yeah. and that. um there have been good experiences though i have to say i only got this far because of um i will say firstly Vern- vernon and jenny or um, vernon was the vicar who got me started and persisted when um well the, the church ignored me he took four years from when he started pestering them till I finally got to the selection conference. But Vernon persisted. His wife, Jenny, um, they both they treated Joanna and I as their children and and really kept pushing on. Uh, And the other person I I like to mention, not just to name drop, but Bishop Stephen has really been crucial for me. Um, I found in him a leader I could follow. And I like the way he did things. He didn't just ram ideas down people's throats. But um, when I spent time with him during the Common Vision Conference, I was close to walking away. But I came away thinking this is this might be worth pursuing for a while. So yeah, that, that's that's uh, a good one. But all the process from the minute Vernon started up until like God ordained. It was obstacle after obstacle after obstacle, and that I got a curacy, I don't want to name who, but it took three very senior people in the church to intervene for it to finally happen. Mm. And even then, in curacy, people do not want me to take funerals, baptisms, weddings for their loved ones. Um, Again, obviously, being black, I'd ruin it somehow. Um, Yeah, so interesting experience, I'll put it that way. Gosh, uh, it it really is tough. um, what, what, what advice would you have, you know, for the, for the average person just to take stock and think about what they could do just to, to make a difference for themselves and for, in other people's lives? Well, I think uh, you and I were chatting about this because of the funny poster you saw, and I agreed. I think there is a lot of ignorance out there. There is fear. And for that, you just think we should emulate children. You know, be educated, be curious. I remember myself, the first time I saw somebody with blonde hair, I actually asked, do you mind if I just touch it? Because I'd never seen blonde hair, clearly. You know, but that curiosity breaks down barriers. And the person could see that I wasn't being racist or anything. It was just genuine curiosity. Mm. And I think taking that initiative to be educated, ask about what you're curious about is quite helpful. 
Um, the second one is something that is more um, specific for us as leaders in the church. Um, I think they formalized it, they call it unconscious bias training, and it really strikes at the heart of what it is that makes us see people as different to us, some of which we may not even be aware of. And I would advocate that for people in leadership because it hurts. You're hurting people even if you don't know it. Um, the, the second or third thing that I would say is that we, all of us, seriously examine our consciences and um, have those uncomfortable conversations or reflections with ourselves. You know, ask questions like, do I really believe the life and welfare of whoever it is I consider as the other? Do I really believe that their life is of equal worth and value as my own? Mm. And I think if we can do that, it is uncomfortable. We actually will be making a lot of progress. Oh. Thank you very much, Leonard. Uh, really appreciate that. And, um, you know, feel free when the coronavirus restrictions are over to, to come and touch my lovely white beard here. <laughs> and uh, uh, anyway, I look forward to seeing you again um, soon, as soon as we can face to face. And uh, but thank you so much for everything you shared with me today. Really appreciate it. So the Church of England describes mission in a fivefold way. And it's not a pick your favourite and practice that, but it's a practice all of them approach. So the fivefold mission uh, marks of the Church of England are to proclaim the good news, to teach and baptise new believers, to respond to human need by loving service, to transform unjust structures of society, and to challenge violence of every kind and pursue peace and reconciliation and to strive to safeguard the integrity of creation and sustain and renew the life of the earth. So how can we go about working against injustice and seeking peace and reconciliation? Now here are just a few ideas. So I was cycling home on the uh, A4 the other day, and just as I was ploughing up a particularly hard part of it, I saw this poster right in the middle of the A4, and it's still there, I took, and I took this picture the other day. It said, ignorance breeds racism, be curious. Now that one poster has stuck with me really for about two weeks and have made me think, because I really like the advice. I think it's one of the most potent and powerful advices. Can we become curious, curious enough to overcome our ignorance, to understand people truly? Because when we become curious, when we seek to understand, the otherness becomes something different. It becomes familiarity. And we can choose to accept that difference isn't wrong, it's just different. You know, we're, each of us are very different in different ways. But we need to look and see where are there ways that we can understand difference and accept difference for being just simply different. So that's one way. Be curious. The second one is this. I want to call it the egg box challenge. You know, if you've got, who could you go to and borrow a box of eggs from? Think about this. Look, in this hand, there are five fingers. And I just want to ask, do we have, each one of us, at least five fingers representing five friends of black, Asian, minority, ethnic backgrounds who you feel you could go and borrow some eggs from. I mean, we've all had to borrow things in this time, but are there people you could do that? And if there aren't, do we need to ask ourselves some questions about whether we truly perhaps have some inbuilt bias, this, uh, as Leonard talked about, that we need to overcome? So I want to recommend to you this egg box challenge. Five people, do you know five people? Could you get to know at least five people? Another thing to do would be to read and discuss together uh, and take time talking, confessing and praying. There's a, a fabulous book at the moment out called uh, We Need to Talk About Race and I have the very last copy from Quench, so sorry about that, but you are welcome to borrow it. But you can get it from Quench and uh, this book is really, really, really helpful at opening your eyes towards what has been happening and is happening.
And I really want to encourage you to take time to uh, look at that, maybe discuss it together. Perhaps this could be a topic for connect groups to look and discuss and think and pray about. So I, I warmly recommend that to you. But I also want to, take to ask you to take time to listen, to investigate the songs, the stories, the tales of life that come from other people's perspectives. I'm going to put a link in to one of my favourite songs by Tracy Chapman called Fast Cars, where she talks about the cycle of poverty and her longing to escape from that poverty. And it's important to listen and hear these works, uh, these, these creative works, these wonderful acts, uh, uh, pieces of art, to understand where people are coming from, to gain empathy in our lives. All of these things help us to become a little bit more Christ-like, to empty ourselves for the sake of others. You know, Christ did it for us, and we should respond in the same way, to take up this mission, to work to transform the unjust structures of our society, decrying violence, pursuing peace and reconciliation. Each and every one of us has a part to pay, whether it's big or small. But I want to end with John. And one of the ways John expresses what he has seen with his own eyes is in these words. He says, no one has ever seen God not so much as a glimpse of him, this one of a kind God expression, that is Jesus, who exists at the very heart of the Father, has made him plain as day. Let's make Christ as plain as day through the actions of our lives, as in our hearts we cross those boundaries and divisions.